Oh, what's up, man? How you doing? I am doing. You're doing? I'm doing. How are you? I'm good. I'm about to uh, start the old pre-broadcast here. I hope you don't mind. Always nice to give a little heads up to everybody, you know. But we could chat. We could chat about all kinds of things. You know? <laughs> How was your week, man? Uh, it was good. It was good. It was, uh, it was quiet. I think you could say it was quiet. It's good. I've always been curious if we could play music on here, you know? I don't, we haven't gotten in any trouble yet, but um, I, mean, I, guess, I guess that's just a big no-no, huh? What do you think the consequences will be? Uh, man, I don't know. Let's try it. Here, one sec. Actually, I can't share two things at the same time, so never mind. Mm. Got to share that title card. I was thinking about um, just for fun, maybe doing a little bit of trivia tonight. Oh, dude, absolutely. Uh, random stuff. Yeah, with uh, Jimena? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I'm looking man. up some questions right now. All right. Hey, I got a question for you. How do you get to a screen where you see all the comments? Because that's always been kind of a weird problem for me. Uh, I do it on my phone. I do it on my uh, phone. So I, I just click on whatever I share because I, I check on the screen. Uh, yeah, okay. I, can't do it, I can't do it on the laptop for some reason. Yeah, on the laptop, it's weird, man. It like, I don't know, it just screws it all up for me. Um, Good idea, sir. Zeke, what's your favorite Bowie album? Told you, Low. Oh, that's right. God, no. How could I forget? Breaking Glass. Um, see, another, another, what is it? Another career in another town? A new, new job in a new town what's the name of that song <laughs> and there's like worse worse was that worse was that there's a lot of cool stuff on that album i remember um i remember hearing about that album because i was uh, i was really into nine inch nails back when uh back in my teens and i remember uh trent risen I, I remember watching an interview and he was saying that he was uh really influenced by that album in particular Really oh stories. really? And before that, the only thing I heard of uh, David Bowie was like his newer stuff that he did in the two thousands. And then, really uh, oh, uh, I, I apologize, man. This is I, you could probably hear this right now, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to like mute it, but I. When did I become so illiterate? Uh, it's all good. It's all good. You could probably hear this right now, right? Okay, I just need to shut it off. My bad, Zeke. I'm trying to like mute it. No worries. Okay, but yeah, so you're into Nine Inch Nails, and uh, Trent Reznor, he was doing an interview, and he was talking about how, like he was really influenced by that album. So I looked for that album because back then we didn't have um, Amazon ready available to us to deliver stuff to, or at least I didn't have access to it. Oh. Hey man, I know that game, you know. But it's always funner to discover music that way, and um, yeah, I think it, it left it left like a lasting impression to me to find out. It's almost like a web, right? You discover one band, and then you you see what they're influenced by, and you you seek out their albums, you check out their band, you know, and it just keeps going and keeps going. And yeah, man. Well, it, you know, it's the whole like album culture, you know, and and. Uh, it's too bad, you know, because 
I don't know. I, yeah, I don't want to sound like an old man, but I guess I am now. And it's like, uh, kids these days, you know, I, I imagine they don't go and get albums. Right. And, and one of the, the, the drawbacks to that is, you know, first of all, I think you're more prone to like, only really care about what's on the radio. Right. And like only care about the one song as opposed to like an entire album. Right. Well, that's the way they're, they're designed now. Like, uh, Drake only releases his singles. Right. Right. Um, but it's interesting, you know, you get so much more with an album than you do with just the one song, of course. And I mean, just sort of, like your your case in point is sort of like okay. You as a musician, you're uh, influenced by Nine Inch Nails, and then Nine Inch Nails, Trent, Trent Reznor's, uh, he's influenced by a, a specific album, right? And um, I don't know. Just imagine if like either of that stuff was just was just one song. Um, it just blow my mind. I get. I, I. I just. I guess I'd be really confused by that. Um, like that album, for example. I think the the single off that the big single off that album was um, "New Career in a New Town." I think right. That was the, that was the single. Of low. Yeah. You know, to be honest, you know, I, I. I. I wouldn't know. You know, because that obviously it came out long before. <laughs> <coughs> right long before i i discovered it <coughs> so i didn't know if it had any uh singles that they played off the radio although i was at target not too long ago and i heard um one of the tracks playing in the background uh, really which one it was, it was the instrumental uh let me see really I'm... at target yeah. yes i wonder if it was like weeping wall or something it surprised me too um man there's some good tracks off that album but see that i i feel like that album specifically it you can't really get the gist of of its worth uh you know just based off the singles right um no. that that album is like a package package deal that, that album's like hey you you know you you take that as like a an entire thing well for real it's a full-on experience full yeah on. sound and vision that's what it's called Oh yeah, Sound and Visions. Yeah. yeah, it's a good song. Man, I heard a cover of that song. Who's that by? Um, I have that saved in my. I have a playlist called Cool Stuff. Um, Sound and Vision. Uh, have you heard of the band The Sea and Cake? No. It's a pretty, you know, they're they're not huge, but yeah, they made a. Uh, cover of sound and vision that is, is pretty good. I think you'd be into that. No shit. Yeah. I think I will check that out actually. Bowie, Bowie, Bowie. Dude, it feels like we haven't done this show in a long time. <laughs> yeah, doesn't it? If we skip one week. <laughs> well, it's funny because, you know, you skip one week and then you sort of worry like, oh, did, did uh, you know, did our, our good friends drop off, you know? Cause you always hear about that, right? With, with online shows or whatever, or with yeah. programming in general, it's sort of like, well, you got to keep going at a scheduled pace or else, uh, you know, if you see them, right? Yeah. I guess that will be the big experiment tonight. No. Um, I, I have a hunch though, you know, I got a hunch. They'll, they'll be here. <laughs> so Zeke since we have a uh, you know some time mm -hmm. time with each other here just chatting away yeah uh, there's so much I don't know about you man oh man all right big, what do you want what do you want to know just a big mystery to me uh <laughs> well okay so let's say your your top three favorite you know, bands slash slash musicians. What what's your top three? They change all the time. To be honest, uh, I'm listening to different things now. Like I'm really into uh, hip hop and R and B at the moment. 
Oh, dude. Uh, I love Leon Bridges. I don't know if you ever heard of Leon Bridges. I've heard of Leon Bridges. Um, he, he does I his have... own take of kind of old school soul R&B. Oh, yeah. that's cool. Uh, is he he's a newer, newer act? Yeah, but I believe his last album came out about two years ago. So okay. I'm, I'm pretty surprised he hasn't garnered like much uh accolades i guess you could say you know uh, right how good he is but interesting what is uh what would you say is like the modern track for uh for releasing albums these days is it is it every two or three years still or is it kind of like more is it like four or five years i guess it really depends huh i think for an uh for an artist that just well this is a trend that i'm, I'm seeing for an artist that barely popping out like travis scott right he released albums uh back to back every year you know so, well 2016 and then it was 2018 19 i believe it's 22 so you know um huh. that's really just know, up I, to I, the individual huh i think it's different now you know people feel like they're catching on and they gotta strike when the iron's hot but you know if you could create like that that's good, right? If you could create, right. Right? but then again, you don't want to release anything half-assed, you know. You really just want to well, release yeah, that's always the risky run, right? If you release things too often, it's sort of like, you know, it needs to be a calculated risk, right? Yeah. All right. So, what are your other two? Uh, I'm still listening to a lot of Led Zeppelin. I love Zeppelin. Oh man, to have that in your top three, I think is a very interesting, cool thing. I would actually love to know a, a bit more about that. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, well, mainly. Well, cause I, I mean, I love Led Zeppelin for sure, you know? And um, I mean, especially in high school, I just went Zeppelin crazy and uh, you know, um, just went Zeppelin. I, I, you could always you could talk about Zeppelin forever. You know what I mean, if you want to. Well, uh, what's your I, what's your take? I think for me, to be honest, I got into it much much later. Like uh, I would listen to it in my teenage years, but I wasn't deeply into it as I was before or now. I guess you could say. But um, you know, there there's certain albums that I do love. Um, there's one in particular, man. It's it's the one with uh, I think it's number four. It doesn't it doesn't have a title. It's the old man with a bunch of like sticks on his back. And he's, um, that's their big album, yeah. That is a big album, yeah. But Stairway to Heaven, I I don't I don't really. I'm not a fan of, to be honest, dude. I have really. <laughs> yeah. Really, is it just because? Is it just because it's overplayed or? Mind me for saying this too. I, I think it's overplayed. It's a little overhyped. You know, it, it doesn't do anything for me. I don't know. Same thing with the Eagles, right? What is that? Uh, California or Hotel California? Oh yeah, yeah. It doesn't no. do anything for me, man. But I, could I, you imagine? Could you imagine being there for when that just came out? You know, um, like I, I feel like Stairway to Heaven. The first time I heard it in its entirety, I was like, oh man, amazing. Hi. Hey, Amanda. How you doing? Fine. Oh. Thank you, guys. How's it going? We're doing good. How are you? Oh, I forgot my shoes. Very shame. good. Thank you so much. Oh. We were just talking about uh, Zeke's top three favorite artists right now, but I, I personally think, uh, you know, I, I, it's an immediate question I would have for you, actually. Okay. Um, um, Zeke, how about we, uh, how about we put that on pause? <laughs> um, and and introduce everybody to our guest tonight, our very good friend Jimena, from from uh, from down down south. Um, welcome to the show. This is hey. actually your sophomore appearance on our show because you were a part of our variety pack episode. Yes. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, I, always a pleasure to see you. I'm really looking forward to chatting more with you. Um, you know, usually for everybody who doesn't know, we've been working with Jimena for the last few months, maybe three or four months now. Um, she's taught us a lot about um, just some basic building blocks of uh, running, running a band, you know, 
um, how to handle social media, how to handle pres our, our presence online, uh, which is a big deal these days because that's really the only presence that any band really has now is online. Um, so, you know, first and foremost, thank you very much for, um, for helping us with all that. And it's a continued journey for us. We, uh, we have seen ourselves kind of, kind of get more expand out into, into more markets, but it's definitely, um, you know, a lot of work to be done and we're looking forward to doing it with you. So thank you. Thank you guys. It's always a pleasure yeah, sure. talking to you anyways. Well, thank you. Um, as everybody can probably assume, Ruben's on his way. He's a very busy man these days, but we will get started without him. And uh, it's actually always, it's always nice to um, have him pop in as a bit of a surprise and, and, <laughs> and take the wheel. You know, I'm, I'm sort of the, I'm sort of the, Zeke and I are sort of the, uh, the warm up act, you know, and, <laughs> and then once Ruben comes in here, it's uh, full throttle, full, full throttle fan, friends, if you will. Oh, yeah. Sort of the, uh, the warm -up. yeah. So, you know, since usually it's all business, Jimena, I, I want to make tonight about, you know, we, there's so much we don't know about you, you know, um, and I, I would say, uh, you know, a question that we just, I just was talking to Zeke about, and I, what I'd love to know from you is what are your top three favorite, uh, you know, bands or musicians right now? Guys, that is just so hard to say. I mean, it's like, what's your favorite movie, Mike? I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's really hard. Um, you know, you want to say frantic romantic in there, right? <laughs> of course I want to yeah. say frantic romantic. <laughs> But let's see, people that I actually play regular music. Okay, it's funny because um, during all this pandemic, I started uh, listening to a lot of uh, 432 hertz, you know, that kind of frequency. Yeah. That it's supposed to be relaxing and stuff. So I really needed that relaxing music really early on the pandemic. And... I don't know any artists of that, but I love that music. All I know is whenever I'm starting to feel really stressed out, I put play on that and it really helps a lot. Oh, wow. And then on the matter of, let's say working out, pop music, really good 90s pop music. I mean, I mm. love exercising with Britney in the background, like I'm a slave for you and stuff like that. No uh, Spice Girls up in there? Spice Girls, of <laughs> course. I love Beyonce, though. It oh, okay. is a great music okay. for working out. But let's say for listening, uh, I'm really liking the Pretty Reckless very, very much. I like her a lot currently. And Frantic Romantic. I already Frantic said. Romantic. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Oh, cool. And, you know, I think this sort of relates back to a much bigger question that I, I feel I've always had for you. And, and really, um, you know, you're obviously very well accomplished when it comes to working with bands. And um, mm -hmm. I, I don't really, you know, I don't really know the history, I guess, right? Um, how, how did you get into, into doing the kind of work that you, you do with bands, whether it be, you know, um, you know, we're helping with PR. Um, I imagine there's, in our case, I, I feel like, you, you know, you are kind of a part-time manager pretty much. Like, like you know, you, you wear a lot of different hats with us. Um, so I, I'm kind of curious, what what got you interested in that? And um, yeah. Okay. My first career is actually uh, filmmaking and audiovisual production. And I did that for about 15 years straight because I started really young. I work in TV, in reality shows, documentary TV, and then I made my own short films. And then I have a long feature documentary of myself and work in a different production. And that was back uh, where I'm from. I'm actually from Tepic, Nayarit, which is a small town. Um, 
on, on top of Guadalajara. You might heard about Guadalajara sometime. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's in the Pacific Ocean, in the Pacific coast of Mexico. And then uh, I moved here to Mexico City and I started working in a media that was dedicated to audiovisual production within music. So mm -hmm. that was like my dream job starting here. Uh, I've always loved music. I'm really a melomaniac. I mean, I, 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 can't, I can't work, let's say, with music because I really get really distracted with music mm -hmm. on the back. So I really need, I can't be listening to music while I'm doing something else. Um, and I've always hang with uh, fellows that had bands or local players or, or something. And then uh, without knowing what was this all about, I started producing stuff like this for them, like for my friends. Mm. Yeah. So I started, you know, I, I knew, let's say, uh, the guy from a local bar and oh, I know that person. Let me ask him if, uh, if I can get you a show, let's say. Or, you know what, I know this person in local TV, let me arrange something for you. St stuff like that, no? And then I was, uh, I met, let's say, a journalist and, oh, you know what, I have a friend or a, a group of friends that has a band. So what about you making an interview with them? Stuff like that. And I moved here and I found out that it was a really huge, strong scene for music here. I started in audiovisual production, then, but then I started meeting a lot of people, uh, different bands, managers, PRs. And then it was like, when I quit my first job here in Mexico City, uh, somebody called me for doing this, actually, the PR process. Mm -hmm. And then I started doing, uh, dedicating myself only to music. And it was just fascinating. I mean, I think, um, I've been doing so well because I managed to mix both abilities, the production yeah. ones, because this is all about production. I'm producing all the time with you guys, with different bands and managing a lot of stuff. And then by learning uh, about the media itself, the scene itself, music industry itself, right? And that's a story. I mean, I think... Um, I have maybe a lot of project management skills, let's say. You do. And a lot of love for the music. And I think I'm living the dream, actually. I'm really proud of myself. I love working with music. <laughs> I love working with bands. I love helping out people like you guys to pursue their dreams, to accomplish their dreams. And as you accomplish your dreams, I'm accomplishing mine, let's say. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, and that's, that's awesome. I mean, you know, we, we have nothing but respect and, and admiration for you. Um, you know, it, it, it's obvious that we, we love to continue working with you. Um, you are kind of the, um, I guess, depending on who you ask you, the fourth member or the fifth member of the band, uh, <laughs> um, you know, but uh it's interesting, you know, because I, I feel like a lot of one of the biggest lessons I've had to learn over the years is, is, you know, w when you start off doing music and uh, for most people, including myself, it's in high school, right? And in high school, you just think, okay, we're the band and we're going to do this now and we're going to do that now. And, and um, no one really ever considers um, that the, the actual band is maybe half of, or probably even less than half of the actual effort being put into having a band work, right? Yes. Um, and it's so important to have somebody that's with us that supports us, but also can give us critical feedback, right? Give us um, feedback that matters, you know, tell us um, um, if, if our stuff is good or if it, if it stinks, right? And, yeah. um, and, you know, and, and I will say, you you do you do a very good job keeping us sort of focused on what we're doing and um, you. you also have a lot of patience sometimes uh, <laughs> during our meetings when we when we tend to go off the rails a bit uh so thank you 
Yeah, yeah. it's um, it's interesting because um, I take rock and roll in a very serious way, and it's an interesting concept because we are really used to perceive rock and roll as sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And we grew up with MTV, and we grew up with magazines and movies. And there's a lot of people, even ourselves, that tend to think that uh, the whole music industry, the whole um, music business is like that. But I found out that it's not, it can be more far away from that scenario. Because if you act like that all the time, you just don't accomplish anything. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> it's more about, I think it's more about a produced concept perceiving music like that because it's also music is also aspirational so of course you want to party of course you want to be rich of course you want to have lots of friends and lots of people around you and stuff like that but but in the in, it actually it's not like that at all I mean of course right. you enjoy yourself of course you're having fun of course it is interesting it is artistic too but it can't be like that and for some reason Let's say it's the same thing that happens in the regular education model, let's say. I'm not sure, I'm not quite sure how it's like there, over there. But I know, for example, that here in Mexico, uh, they don't teach us basic life skills, like let's say tax payment or mm -hmm. self-administration mm -hmm. or let's say um, inteligencia emocional, how do we call that? Um, to actually try to solve your emotional issues and handle oh. them in a smart way. And we, we don't have any of that in our education system here. <laughs> All those things you just listed, we, we don't have any of that here. Uh, we don't have them either. So it's like, the, it's the same in music. I mean, in music schools, they regularly teach you how to play, how to write song, how to do stuff in music, but they don't teach you how to manage yourself. They don't teach you how to develop your own project. They don't mm -hmm. teach you how to project your band to a different level, let's say. Right. And I think, yeah, it, that happens a lot in general. Right, yeah. And it, it, you know, the whole sex, drugs and rock and roll thing, um, what I find really interesting about that is it seems like a lot of times it's sort of, uh, sold to audiences to be that way but then you know for a lot of bands at, at least back then um, when things were a bit different um, it seems like a lot of bands sort of put on that ruse and then and then once the cameras are off it's like you know they're just a, a lot of overworked and exhausted and of course uh, uh, surprisingly normal normal people right of course I mean yeah. if you ever uh, if you have ever been in a tour you know that by the day five you're already really tired I right. mean in general the, the transportation the carry carry stuff out the playing the talking to people the stage there's a lot of work to be done there so of course, at the end of the day, you're really tired. I mean, who, who could, I don't know, party until next morning, <laughs> knowing that you have a, another show that same night, right? And uh, yeah. what's pretty sad is, is that you hear a lot of these uh, SoundCloud rappers, uh, they're overdosing or they're being manipulated by, by their record company. You know, they're, yeah. they're being fed all these uh, Percocets and all these, all these like pills. Oh. They're not, they're not, they're not really lasting. There's no substance there. You know? They're all falling apart. You're totally right. And personally, I think that's really lame in general. Like what kind of life is that? I don't know. Yeah. Living life half asleep. Yeah. Well, you know, there is something kind of interesting psychologically. And I, I know that for myself, it, it kind of is a little bit this way too, you know, um, I heard a while ago, um, it was actually, I, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this YouTube channel called the Punk Rock NBA with Finn McKenty, but he goes into a lot of different things about scenes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's talking about Fred Durst, right? Fred Durst, the singer of Limp Bizkit and, and um, how, 
you know, yeah, I mean, like we look back on him now and it's like he's super annoying kind of and like how did anybody ever really like him and, and that sort of thing, right? But at the time when Limp Bizkit was hugely popular, it's sort of like he was doing a lot of smart things where, you know, it really, especially if we're talking about the late 90s, early thousands, I think the music industry was much more, you know, the attention industry, right? Of course. Uh, um, and, and keeping in headlines and, and really, you know, in order to keep in the head in headlines, you sort of have to do things that are a bit taboo. Right. And, and me as an audience member, I can, I can tell you that, you know, in, in my more formative years, um, you know, as a kid looking up to people that are, are that way, right. That are, um, either have bad attitudes or live dangerously or, or that sort of thing, um, there is a bit of an attraction to that, right? It's sort of like people look, people look to these people to do things that we can't do ourselves, right? Like, yeah, I could, I could never, I could never do heroin, you know. I could never um, party all night, right? <laughs> um, but like, oh man, I really admire that this person's able to do that, and and you know, look look at this life that they're living, right? Um, and it's like sort of a really unhealthy thing. Uh, and, and hopefully, I, I think we're kind of past that. Um, possibly? I don't know. It's also a really, um, I think it, it is a really childish behavior. Because at the end, it's all about evading yourself from reality. I mean, just right. grow up and face your issues and face your life. And by doing all of that, I mean, of course, when we all feel like maybe kind of low, we all evade ourselves. It is a normal human behavior, I guess. But you can't live your life like that all the time, you know? Right. I mean, you can, but it's not like the best scenario possible for, for a person, I think. And I, I was watching this documentary this morning, too, of, um, of the singer from uh, Alice in Chains, Blaine. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they were talking about the last five years of his life you know he, oh man you know he was basically a hermit um in his apartment shooting up heroin and it got to a point where like he needed it in order for his body to function you know Not, of yeah, course really blunt, but it's just really sad going out that way because he was he was dying slowly you know his, his um, band members they would come see him whenever they could because they said that it got to the point where he wouldn't answer the door or answer the phone you know and, and people basically thought he was already he was already gone so it's a sad you know you would imagine like this great rock and roll ending of him burning out in the flames of glory but he kind of it was kind of sad that he fizzled, fizzled out and he was such a talented singer you know? he was oh, yeah. for, I mean whenever uh whenever I talk I hear about this subject or talk about this subject all I can think of let's say it's Rolling Stones I mean, of course, when they were really young, they were doing all these sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But uh, they're alive and still rocking, and they're eighty something. But of mm -hmm. course, they have been uh, living the last twenty years, not drinking, not partying, may working out a lot. I don't mm -hmm. know, living a healthier life. And at the end, they're there you know, in, on a stage. Yeah. Well, I remember Mick Jagger. Yeah, Mick Jagger basically reached a point where he's just like, I can't, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> and then he just stopped. Yeah. And then he just started oh, taking care of himself. Like vegan and doing yoga now. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that's the attitude of somebody that truly loves what they do. They truly right. love music and they put music or playing or stage or audiences on top of everything else. That's why they, they believe in their lives like that, right? Yeah. So, I mean, that's a cool example to look at. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's crazy. I mean, you know, you look at someone like Keith Richards and um i mean he must take care of himself right like yes. 
he smokes a lot though. I mean, that's he probably smokes and do yoga at the same time. Well, he probably gets blood transfusions, like everybody oh. says, often, right? Oh yeah, like oil changes, like oil changes, right? Huh? Well, yeah. there's a lot of stories about him, like you know, like uh, freezing ther- therapy and blood changing all the time and stuff like that. I think Jared Leto turned him into a vampire or something like that. I think that's what happened. Is that movie ever going to come out, by the way? Or probably not, huh? You mean that autobiography of uh, Jared Leto? Jared. Probably, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Everything on Warner is going to be on HBO Max. Yeah, that's right. Ruben, how's it going, man? Good, good. I was telling everybody earlier that, you know, Zeke and I are sort of like the, the warm up. We're, we're the warm up act, you know. And then, and then when you come in, you're you're sort of the the, the Conan O'Brien of the show, you know. <laughs> that's that's when we're like full full force uh, friends. I'm sure. Oh man, I'm like a Craig Kilborn at best, man. Don't don't even trip, you know. <laughs> I'm sure Craig nobody guy. even know, gets that reference, right? I, oh, uh, I do. I do. Oh, okay, okay. I remember him. <laughs> Um, yeah, he, yeah, he sucked. <laughs> he was okay. He was a bit of a he was a bit of a stick in the mud, right? But you know, he was no John Stewart man. Show definitely picked up after John Stewart got you know, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we're okay, so, uh, real yeah. quick. Who's our sponsor tonight? Oh man, um, did I miss it already? Did no, I miss it? Already? No, no, no. You actually did not miss it, man. I've been, I've been wanting to show this. For, do I even have it still? Do I have this? Did they drop us? Did the sponsor drop us? I okay. do have our sponsor. Um, okay, okay. So here's the thing, you guys. Um, tonight's sponsor. Tonight we're sponsored by a very special Blu-ray release. Um, and that is Led Zeppelin meets the Ninja Turtles. <laughs> Listen, you love you love their music, you love their antics and shenanigans. What happens when Shredder teams up with the Who to fight both these super teams? Oh my God! Now is that a Simon Phillips era the Who or before? Uh, wh- whichever era they had a feud with uh, Led Zeppelin in. <laughs> So listen, join Raffi, Donnie, Mikey, Leo, Bonzo, Jonesy, Jimmy, and Rob Rob on this very special adventure where Led Zeppelin meets the Ninja Turtles. Because whatever, you'll watch it. I'd watch it. Hey, it's on USA, right? I mean, nothing else is on. <laughs> or TNT. TNT, I don't know. TBS, they know drama, something like that. It's right after the first Die Hard movie. That was played five times in a row. Yeah. 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 Cool. So, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. I'm I'm glad I uh I had that in my pocket. Uh I <laughs> absolutely. There's been a couple episodes, I gotta tell you, there's been a couple episodes where I wanted to where I wanted to put that one up the last two episodes, but I thought, you know, tonally speaking, maybe this isn't great for, for this episode. Um, like I couldn't imagine you doing that with Desidera. She'd be like, "Right, is that is that a real movie?" Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. But um, there and you, you know go. What and... I think would be great is the, la traducción en español en México. Siempre le cambian los títulos a las películas, so I could only imagine people running with this one, right? Oh my God, that would be. I mean, of course, in Spanish is Las Tortugas Ninja. Las Tortugas Ninjas, right, right, right. Las Tortugas Ninja, no, pero. Seguro sería algo así como la fiesta de los tortugas ninja, like something completely like different. And, yeah, right? exactly. The translation, this kind of translation goes <laughs> so so wrong. Right, like, right. The original movie title can be uh, one word. Home of- alone, or like home alone, right? Ah, yeah. Home alone is mi pobre angelito. Angelito, right? Completely different. It's my poor little angel, or angel. something like that in Spanish. Oh, mm-hmm. really? Yeah. yeah, my favorite, my favorite best example here, right, of things I think that are slaughtered. There's this movie that came out about cows. It was a cartoon. It was called Home on the Range. I remember that. Well, yeah. I saw it in Mexico and it was Las Vacas Chistosas. And I was like, are you 
freaking kidding me, dude? Like, try a little more effort than that. In yeah. Spanish, it's the funny cows. The oh, funny cows. Okay. Come on, man. You know, like, dude, I, mean, I like really that bad. name. Dude, I like you know that what, name though? a lot more. Now that I just said it out loud, I'm like, you know what? I think I would see that movie. The funny cows. Because of the lack of effort. In the title, I would you know? really like to meet somebody that that works on that area of movie <laughs> who does that right who does that like, I mean, like they I have such a good sense of humor yeah. right they have such a good sense of humor it's like zero effort and it's so funny i want to i want to switch careers now i want to be that guy <laughs> that sounds like such a fun job <laughs> Yeah. Sorry for taking us on that wild tangent there, but it's just, <laughs> I think about this shit all day. I mean, come on, you know, sorry. Of <laughs> Yay, it's so true, it's so true. <laughs> so you were saying, Jimena, I'm sorry, before I, I so rudely saying, just no. popped in. What we were talking about before, oh no, we were talking about how uh, true rock stars are, how... Uh, sex people think rocks. it's all about party right it's kind of a facade yeah. right it's kind of just a ruse yeah i mean i mean it's like it's like you have to be be like the best of both worlds like maybe yes. you can do that but if you're very successful if you have a product something that's very genuine that connects with people something that that you can actually make a living off of right like i don't know it's crazy you know what i don't think so not even being really famous Let, let's take amy winehouse for example like her last shows were just really sad and people mm-hmm. started noticing i mean it was not just that one last catastrophic show that we all know about um, she was really bad let's say maybe six months after she passed away right and their shows were really terrible she they suffered they singing. suffered yeah right they and suffered i remember let's say a scene from uh, the movie the doors oliver stone one mm-hmm. right where right. jim morrison was so high that he couldn't sing at all and mm-hmm. they couldn't even record anything not right. even half of a song so no i mean it's not even if you're really famous and you live out of it you can't act that way all the time. I mean, I can only imagine by looking, watching this movie, The Dirt, I'm feeling like being a personal manager for Motley Crue, it, it had to be like- A nightmare, right? A nightmare, hell. Right, right, yeah. right. Hell You're just babysitting, I mean, no, babysitting no, no, some no, no, immature people all day, you know? No, no, no. No, such a pain in the ass. I mean, it, it, and people's it, people goes like, yeah, but you were making a lot of money, so my life would be miserable, would be right. so frustrating, would be so stressful. So stressful, right? Yeah. So no, I don't think so. Because like, you're serving, you're serving like two masters, right? You're serving the band that you're trying to keep happy. You're trying to keep them creative in a creative space. But then you also have to answer to whoever the label is, whoever the people who are actually paying the bills. You know oh, I mean? yeah. Exactly. And the venues. And you have to keep them in contract. It's, it's exactly. a fucking well, nightmare. Yeah. Not to mention, I mean, you know, nowadays, and I don't know how long it's been this way for, but I know nowadays there's like insurance companies. Yeah. You know, you, you have to, uh, you, you have to be insured and, and um, I mean, a lot of times if, I mean, if someone's like a, a drug addict or, you know, if, if, if someone can't be trusted to fulfill, for example, doing an entire tour without getting busted and, and sent into rehab or something, then, yeah, you know. Yeah, totally. But also, you know what? I think like the manager or the management model is really changing within this new industry or this new music business model because, um, like old school managers used to do that all the time. But right. let's, say, let's say new managers are more and more into, let's say, teamwork, for an example, mm-hmm. right? And I noticed I once worked as a personal manager for one night with a really popular band here in Mexico that I'm not going to name. Magneto. <laughs> you and I know. You and I know what's up. Of Magneto. Course. Please do that song of Magneto. Please, I beg you. We will. We will. I promise. Yeah. We, will. Awesome. we will. We will. So we will. I work with this band. And then the frontman, I was walking with him into the stage. And he gave me the box of his uh, in-ears. 
but but he just dropped it like he gave it to me and then uh i look at the stage manager and ask him like why is he giving this to me right and the other guy was like oh yeah he do that all the time he does that all the time so give it to me don't worry okay so uh i w i look and then this stage manager gave it back to him to the singer the box and i was like okay it's fine by the end of the show um the manager a friend of mine that hired me for that night uh then I asked him like, okay, so everything was good. How about the guys? And he was like, yeah, yeah, they're really happy. They're really cool with your work. Just a little detail. This guy's saying that you lost the box of the in-ears. And I was like, what? So hmm. it's my fault. Yes. So he's saying I lost his stuff. Yes. And I was like, man that's not possible and he was like i know i know but they're really used to old school managers of course if you were an old school manager that would have been your responsibility but you're right. not so i understand so don't worry hmm. it's all fine then i was like and yeah and the lead guitar of that band uh he arrived at the venue later than everybody else and outside in the taxi at the uber he called me and said Hey, how's it going? I'm right outside. Okay. And I was waiting for him to inside, you know, uh, in backstage. And I was like, what's with this guy? So he was waiting outside for me to go outside. And carry his shit or something? Yeah. No, oh. and, pick him, and pick him and take him backstage. And I was like, okay. I mean, you have two legs. You can walk backstage <laughs> you know but this, this you know, is like, that this is that famous band i heard of that has a toddler for a lead guitarist where he needs to be held by the hand and walk yeah. to the stage they're yeah. so amazing yeah. they're and such I, an amazing like, band and i would have understood if you know there was like a crowd you know over yeah. the, the uber or something like that 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 was just not happening he wanted me <laughs> to go pick him up and take him backstage so those are things about old school bands as well old school bands and old school managers right i think everything's changing now totally yeah wow that's uh sorry that you had to put up with that <laughs> at the end it was fun it was just like but but i didn't take it the wrong way because i was like really well like, it's just one night only right you comes put up from, with the ship for comes one from night a different only. time though yeah yeah, exactly. But it was really funny, though. Like, okay, so I don't know what's with these people. But yeah, I, I do understand. And it's also really, um, you can notice by working in different areas with bands. I've worked with bands that used to be famous in the 90s, let's say here in Mexico. And then yeah. they keep doing music now. And it's really hard to actually communicate them these new ways of music mm -hmm. business or management and music. for them to adapt right to the way business yes. is going now yeah the new model yes. right exactly so it's really hard to convince them of some different model that they're used to i could just and imagine that conversation you're like guys do not order eight tracks people are not gonna <laughs> buy eight tracks you know <laughs> that you know that specific subject is so interesting <laughs> Because some of them, I beg them, like, please release your songs one by one, because that's mm -hmm. the way. Yeah. It's a new model. Um, right. yeah. I'm going to make a record and I'm going to spend all of this money because this is my work, my artistic work. Yes, I understand. And it's totally fine. And it's totally right. At the end, get, the, get the bigger bang out of it, right? Yeah, Do it exactly. little by little. And then exactly. cul culminate it with the big release. Exactly. At the end, you're just gonna still have as you somebody I know did that, didn't they, Mike? Uh, who are we talking about? Us? Yeah, man. Come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We. Um, I, I mean, people have heard this story a lot by now, but you know, we we attended this uh, EA Games seminar, and and you know. Yeah. it was like what was it three days yeah it was like a three-day thing 
And on the third day, they had some people from a couple people from a different from different um, departments there. Record right? this record special, labels, yeah, right. And they and that's what they said. They said, you know, there's no there's no reason to release an album um, because it's like why put out twelve songs all at the same time and have it last two weeks if you're lucky, you know, for people to be interested. Why not take those 12 songs and spread them out for 12 months, right? Months. It's like, oh, yeah, that, that totally makes sense. And they told us this as we had just gotten the masters for our new record, right? You know? But no, we... Oh, go ahead. Go, Sorry. go ahead, go ahead. No, no, no. I, I was saying that um, also, I mean, it's not that the bands or the musicians are obligated to magically guess that you know or right. to magically know that right that's right. why there's people like me people like a lot of people that been researching all the time and it's it's also it's not it's not something let's say whimsical about music business it has a reason to be and the way it is like that now it is uh, because of the uh, consumption model that we're right. looking at now in general people are not engaged naturally with 12 pieces of a work of a piece of art a body of work right right yeah. yeah people are consuming songs are consuming episodes are consuming uh five minute content are consuming 15 second content so right. as you notice that you know like oh yeah you know what you're right it's i mean it's only logical if you look at the audience if you think as the audience, if you study the audience like um, like a natural form that it's changing all the time because also the audience doesn't behave the same way for a long time. Mm -hmm. right, right, right. So, but you need to be really onto that subject on because the audience is a, it's, it's still the most important thing about music business, right? Yeah, that's yeah. who we're, we're creating for, in a sense, if we're trying to sustain a living off of that, we're, we're trying to keep up with the audience and at least engage the audience, at the very least, right? Yes, totally. Well, you know, and what's interesting is, I mean, if you were to take a, like a 10-year span, right, and, and this is kind of bouncing off of what you said, Jimena, about, you know, people don't consume content the same way for, for very long, right? Um, I'd say, you know, the new structure of, of doing things with music now is a lot more um, makes a lot more sense than let's say 10 years ago. I think, you know, 10, if we're to look back in 2010, that was before kind of this notion of, of, Oh yeah. Why, why release now when you can just release a single, you know, that, that was before people had started really kind of saying that, you know, uh, yeah. I, I could I, be wrong, I, but um no, that's true, though. Those tre the, the trends were different at that time. If you think about it, social media itself influenced a lot of that. And that's when that was the big, the big boom, right? When it came to those companies that were coming out. They existed yeah. a little bit before 2010, but 2010 on was when they just started, like, picking up. And then the culture in general, pop culture changed, was yeah. influenced. You know, like, uh, looking, back, uh, looking back at the history, it all started the new model of music business started in exactly in 2003 2003 was the day that apple music started mm -hmm. right and apple music started a, as a, an alternative uh to napster actually napster came to change all the game right, right. first yeah. first right yeah first so uh, napster and limewire yes giving everybody viruses right exactly <laughs> So uh, Napster was there, and then, of course, they all realized that they were losing a lot of money. And then the first people that uh, tried to change oh that, I mean, to adapt to that new model or to adapt that technology to music was Apple. And mm -hmm. from that, then all the companies and platforms that we know now, they started doing the same thing. And it changed. What it actually changed was the goal of music business before in the, in the ages of big record labels, the main goal was to sell CDs. Yeah. Or physical, physical product. Physical right? Right. Move product. plastic. Exactly. They would say move plastic, right, right. Exactly. 
And then when the music started to be on your computer, on your cell phone, or your, on your MP3 player, do you remember those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on your iPod, actually. Um, so it was a game changer because now the, the main goal is the audience. I mean, artists now live from live shows or right. you know, aside merchandise. Yeah, from performances. Performances, performances and merchandising, right. Or different products related to the band, right? And so as the goal is different, the ways of introducing that product or, or to take that product to actual buyers is really different. And that is why. Yeah, that's why it changed. You know, I think in the end, I was reading an article about how like Spotify's um, business model isn't sustainable. I think I shared it with you guys at some point where they were talking about how like they're not really made to make a lot of money unless they bump their subscriptions up really high, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's the exact same amount of content that they have is the exact same amount of content that everybody else has. I think it's like 70 million songs or 70,000. I forget what it is. Something ridiculous. And that's made me come to the conclusion that I think the winner, the last standing with the last man, last man standing or whatever will be Deezer. <laughs> oh sorry, man. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> love Deezer, man. I couldn't help it, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh my God. But, but it's know. true though. Right. Like I feel like, I feel like the, even this new model is going to have to change pretty soon, right? Oh, sure. I feel like it is. And that's, you know, uh, you know, time keeps on slipping, right? Uh, right. You know, right. It, into the future, right. Into the future, man. Um, <laughs> and the music industry seems to be something that um, has had a, a really interesting journey over the last 20 years, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's the one, I think it's the one branch of the entertainment industry that kind of hasn't really intentionally done anything to to help itself like itself itself right right you know the film industry and the tv <laughs> industry tv industry man has just blossomed right um the film industry seems to be fine um you know but uh music i don't know it 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 they seem like they're always trying to catch up to what's going on, right? Uh, the, the big labels, I guess, is what I mean. Is you know, the big labels seem like they're always trying to catch up to what's going on. You know, you know, like, and not, not to interrupt you, I think it, it kind of falls back on what Jimena was saying that people with this old school mentality are real oh, stubborn yeah. and they do not want to adapt until they say, holy shit, we're in trouble. We need to do something. We need to, you know? And right. they do, and they do it drastically sometimes, but I don't know. You know what I mean? Well, like that's the, what I feel, right? Yeah, like the birth of the 360 deal, I think was maybe, you know, the reaction to that, right? <laughs> right. It's all reactive, man. That's the and thing, then what, right? Like Atlantic. I ain't it. I'm just saying, you know? I, I mean, this is a few years ago now, but like Atlantic Records, I, I saw they, they, they had signed somebody that was really only famous for being on like Dr. Phil or something. I, do, you, do you remember yeah, yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Catch me outside. Catch me outside, girl. Right. And the, and the girl weird. who was like just the meme, basically. And then they were like, they were selling her as like, she can actually rap. And I'm like, yeah, but is she <laughs> any good? Right. Like, you're just doing it out for pop culture. Like, that's it's like giving like Kim Kardashian a record deal. I'm, you know what? She probably does have a record deal. I don't know. You know? But the interest is Humana, that... right? What was that? that? Paris Hilton, right? Yeah, Paris Hilton has a. She does have a, a few records out, right? You? I mean, I, I only remember one of them. I don't know. I'm not, I don't have facts okay. here. I'm not looking at any sheets where I'm like, well, actually, no, I don't know. <laughs> but it's interesting, right? Because it, because when you think about it, it's sort of like at one point there was people sitting around a, a, a table at Atlantic Records saying, okay, who do, who do, who do we sign? You know? And Dude, yeah. Someone exactly. there, someone there was like, "Hey, I just saw this person on Doctor Phil. I, I think this Catch would be a outside. great idea." <laughs> Dude, I always think that when I see, okay, like, and and I'm not saying any anything I'm attached to is perfect or whatever, but you know, there, there's times I'll come across something and I really think, "Who the hell funded this? Like, who gave this the green light? Who said, hey, 'Hey, I'm gonna invest money in this'?" You know? 
Well, yeah, uh-huh. and I mean, maybe I there's know. some. Uh, what's interesting is, um, and I kind of came to this conclusion the other day about about myself and about the band and about bands in general, right? Um, everything you do is an experiment for the court of public opinion, right? Yeah, yeah. totally. And what's great about it is you get to see successful and failed experiments all the time, mm-hmm. you know? And I, I think the reason I was thinking about this in general was, you know, I was thinking about like, for, for example, actors that have been canceled, right? They've been me too Right, right. And, and how, how some of them lash out and they say, oh man, this isn't fair. And, you know, you know, uh, I can't believe I was canceled and all this, but but anything you do for entertainment, once you become a public figure, anything you do is automatically an experiment for the court of public opinion. And and you know, I it's guess it, game, I right? guess in the case of like someone like Kevin Spacey or Bill Cosby or whatever, it's sort of like, yeah, if you're a bad person and you've done bad things, like you don't it's gonna bite you, you in the don't ass, deserve right? yeah. to have a career yeah, yeah. You, you 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 have to be a good person right um or else people or at are least not gonna... at least at least just not be a piece of shit you know what i mean at exactly least, right? exactly yeah. and and you know it it some people like especially this comes up with like louis ck where it's like oh are you supposed to like kind of brush louis c C-C, louis ck under the rug and like pretend that he never existed and all this and that and it's like well i mean it's what well, people he, want. It's it's and, whatever and you know people what? want. He doesn't do himself any favors by keeping fucking opening his mouth every time he does do something publicly. He just still has like a backlash himself. Like you were saying, like, hey, that's not fair. It's like, well, dude, come on. Also, you, you know? have to be responsible. I mean, by, by being accountability. Responsible, yep. Yeah, you, you have to be. Yeah, of course, you have to be a good person all your life, no matter who you are. But at the end, if you want to be a public person, you have to be responsible. And mm-hmm. what do I mean by being responsible? You have to accept and face the consequences of your acts. If you don't like to be publicly judged by your actions, so don't be a public person. Right, 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 right. Because right. if you decide to go and be a public person, you have to assume and you have to admit and make responsibility out of it because you're going to be... Uh, or scrutinized or evaluated yeah. yeah exactly like that if not just take a different way yeah right right and, but what's in what's interesting about music and sorry that i tangent in, into all that stuff but it's important stuff hey it's cool um what's interesting about music and i think it applies more to music than it does to to film and tv is you literally have to create lightning in a bottle every time you put something out and and there's something so less empirical about what is going to make a song good and what people are going to like at a very specific time that you put this stuff out right right um because i mean a good film you know it requires a good story it requires a good screenplay it requires good acting it requires good cinematography Cinematographer, right right and and those are things that you can hopefully predict more or less yeah they're tangible they're tangible things right yeah totally with the track more record. or less more or less. there's more some things that you can't predict uh for sure um of course but with music what's so interesting is like you know it largely doesn't depend on skill mm-hmm. and i guess what i mean by that is like you can have the most simple song be just the biggest hit it could be four chords you know right. and, and it could just be the biggest thing ever um you know it could be auto-tuned just to death and, it, and people will still love it, right? Yeah. Um, and that's what's so interesting about, I think specifically more than anything music is, you know, it's an experiment in pleasing the, the court of, of public opinion. Public opinion, you're right, yeah. The idea I think is to, um, to reach some balance as Korakai is been telling us from the beginning. Like, <laughs> reach your balance, learn your balance, because it's also, I mean, of course there's people all around the world making music in the commercial way because there's actually formulas for that. They mm. are, they exist. And yeah, Nickelback, yeah. yeah there's, there's, 
<laughs> there's a lot of people uh, creating music mm. that way and probably they are being more successful, let's say. But uh, in the other hand, you have really creative people that has a really strong concept and it's really strong, really strong message to tell to the audience. And that kind of people needs to reach a balance where they are saying why they, what they want to say and play the music that they want to play. And at the same time, uh, transform that message so it can reach more people, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. it, is, it is a balance. And, but at the end, it, it's also like you're saying, like it, it is a great adventure. It's an experiment. Experiment, right. And it sounds like a cliche, but uh, as long as you're staying or you're keeping true to yourself, it's going to it's going to go better. Yeah. Most you know, important. I say, yeah. I say I am going to be true to myself, but I need to pay the bills. Yeah. <laughs> nah. <laughs> For real though, right? It's like it's like finding that balance in that too, right? Like being the best professional you can be and being really focused on doing like quality work with people that you feel have the same kind of vision with you i think that's that's a key to, to being happier doing this you know totally, totally yeah i mean ruben zeke and i we we have a a powerful powerful bond based on deezer now <laughs> yeah yeah know? we do yeah and and that really deezer is the fuel that fuels frantic romantic it's frantic romantic's lifeblood right let me, let me tell you that a lot of people in central america agree with you yeah, that's, that's a trip, right? Yeah. That's a trip. Yeah, yeah. In other yeah. parts of the world, yeah, yeah. They start oh, really Deez follow Deezer. Yeah, Deezer's like a big thing. It's a okay, it's yeah. a trip. <laughs> it is. I'm just okay. being a mean, a mean American and just teasing it. But no, yeah, a lot of people do follow yeah. Deezer. Well, that's great. I, good, good for them. I'm <laughs> good for them. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys sure Deezer's not our sponsor tonight? <laughs> we're trying. We're, we're, we're trying. Always. <laughs> we're trying. Yeah, we're trying here. Yeah. Hey, you got any questions, guys? Like, I feel like this conversation is like such a good conversation that I'm completely losing myself in that, and I'm completely neglecting the audience. Oh, it's sorry, oh. Jeff. Sorry, Mondo. Sorry, probably Andrew Sova. I don't you know. know. Ma Mondo's. Uh, he's actually. Uh, he's not here tonight, man. Oh. I'm. A, I'm a bit sad. Yeah, I'm a bit saddened. It's okay, oh, though. God. <laughs> we did have Marlene chime in. She says that Chris Brown is still making music, but he's not making albums. He's still doing singles, though. So I think that's how he stays current. You know, he jumps on a brand new artist track, but uh, he doesn't. I don't, I don't think he really makes his own albums anymore. I I, yeah, I think I think it's like the same thing, right? Like he has, he knows that he has some star power, but he knows he's blacklisted a little bit so this is kind of like a what do they call that like a, a back door or whatever to, to still stay relevant you know interesting because i mean chris uh. brown fucked up we know he fucked up big time right. you know yeah yeah that's all i gotta say there's no punchline to that it's just it's no, also he fucked up yes can, can, can kevin spacey do that in the film can he be a secondary role what do you guys think oh no 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 huh? no, I said no maybe, and I'd say maybe in 10 years because people tend to do that shit like out of nowhere someone who oh, like Mel Gibson or something right 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 or like I even Kramer right so. I, I really doubt not even in 10 years I don't think he's coming back ever again yeah like he, he crossed a line yeah. like did, legal legal lines you know what I mean like yeah. like right. violent crime lines um with Mel Gibson it was a little bit different just because he had a I you know have you heard the Mel Gibson uh... <laughs> the tape? Yeah. But you know what? He he's a known alcoholic too, and I'm not I'm not saying this is an excuse, man. But he it seems like he has a lot of rage, and that comes out when he drinks. You know? Right. And I, I think what no, yeah no excuse or anything, but I I think what it was is people were looking for that that redemption tale. You know what I mean? They were like, oh man, he's he's really uh, you know Mel Gibson is really. Um, Man, you just hit you just fix hit himself right? up. But you're right. right. People people love that. People love to see people put themselves back together. Again. You're right. For Robert me Dunn's though, man. I, yeah. I, I... Do you know, let's say, the Brendan Fraser story? I heard. I heard his story. That's hella sad. No, I it, hella sad. 
it is. So you want to know what it is? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's been told that you remember that Brendan Fraser from George of the Jungle. Oh, yeah. And then, Encino Man. Love him. Yeah, the please. Mummy. Right. And then he jumped. He played Rick O'Connell in The Mummy. Yeah, I remember it's, him. Exactly. Yeah. The Mummy. So he was a... <laughs> <laughs> Right. So he was a huge artist back then, <laughs> and all of a sudden, uh, he stopped appearing in movies like that. Right. He just stopped. Yeah. It was like he was not acting anymore. So um, the story, rumor has it, that it was his PR manager that was trying to uh, hit on him, oh. and he said no. And he came back like, okay, no, so I'm going to destroy your career, your whole career. The only way you're going to, yeah, the only way you can keep your career is if you go with me. So he said no. And he said no. And he was confident that that was not going to happen because he was already such a huge star. And that happened. Uh, He was uh, was actually sexually assaulted, too. I was reading something about that. Yes. And that he got super depressed and then his like life just kind of fell apart, you know, because of that. Like it totally like messed with him, you know? Exactly. And that's that's why he changed so much. I mean, all mm-hmm. of the gossip right. magazines talking about how he was so overweight and he, he was getting old and he was doing some other stuff. And but OK, but he's making a nice comeback. He's yeah. In- Doom Patrol. Yeah. Doom Patrol. Yeah. That's a really nice one. Yeah. Well, that's that's too bad. Yeah, I, I mean, Brandon Fraser seems like a, a cool dude, and uh, yeah, I, I did wonder why he fell off. Right. Just kind of fell off. Yeah, just fell yes. off a cliff for like ten years, basically. Um, it's interesting. I mean, it's yeah, I tra- only, tragic. I only, totally. I only just read that like over the summer. I was reading about that. I was reading somebody else who was talking about how he finally felt comfortable and he came forward about that. And I was like, shit, man, that's, that's crazy. You know what I mean? That mm-hmm. ugly shit like, like that happens all the time. And it's just, right. exactly. I don't know. It's just, it's disgusting to me when I think about people being just so malicious and so just, right. you know what I mean? Trying to take the power from people, like, you know, like trying to throw people off. It's just, I hate that, you know? Yeah. yeah. Totally. But yeah. Well, you know, honestly, Jimena, I I could probably talk for another three hours. With I know, you. right? Me too. Um, Me too. I mean, we're such, you know, we're already such good buds that this episode was, you know, we 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 skipped past the whole like, oh, you know, ha- so you know, the boiler boilerplate questions and all that. So uh, it was a very good conversation, and <laughs> and thank you for being on. Of course, oh, I yeah. am the time cop um and i apologize that is my role and um it is time for us to say goodbye to our lovely audience um we would ask that you spend uh you know the next minute or two just telling our our lovely audience more about where they can find you where they can find more info about you things that are coming up that they should know about take it away Okay, so uh, you can find me in all Feroz Gestion del Rock um, social media. Feroz means fierce, let's say. So this is the name of my uh, label. It's fierce because I'm fierce, right? Fierce. (laughs) (laughs) So you can find us as Feroz Gestion del Rock in, in Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. We have really interesting content. And also, Feroz is working now in um, a summit, a conference, an event called Eva Music Market. Uh, It is uh, one more option of music markets where the main goal is to create networks, work networks for music industry and music business. Uh, So this event is going to happen in March 2021. And in the meanwhile, we decided that all of the artistic part of the Eva Music Market is going to be formed only by uh, projects led by women. And we have a open call for entries for projects led by women within metal, punk, experimental, and ordinary people. So Mm -hmm. please uh, go uh, to Eva Music Market, uh, Facebook and Instagram too, and YouTube as well. And just 
uh, keep in touch, look the program that is already up in the website. That is evamusicmarket.com. And we'll be happy to hear from you. And if there's any other independent bands over there trying to make it on music, you can always reach out to us. We'll be happy to help you out or at least talk to let you know more about how this is uh, going on. And we'll be happy to know more music and to hear you out. Cool. I got to shoot you uh, a band called Infinite Sleeps Info. Good friends okay. of mine. They've been wanting to break into Mexico for a long time. Okay, I keep cool. trying to get them solutions. Yeah, when you said that, I was like, I man, so you know what I mean? Like, uh. <laughs> awesome. Pues vamos a despedirnos en español porque sí. eh, Mr. Kerosene y Ezequiel tienen que practicar su español. Así Un que... poquito, ¿verdad? Sí. Buenas noches, amigos. Muchas gracias por tenerme en este espacio eh, con ustedes. Un saludo a todos. Eh, gracias, Ruben. Gracias, sí. Gracias, Mr. Kerosene. You know how smart I sound in Spanish, like Sofia Vergara, you know? You right, know? right. How smart would you be in Spanish, right? Exactly. exactly. So, this so is como like se that. diría hanging with the friends? Como, como, how would you name it if this was a, f a film in Mexico? What would you change the title to? Um, Aventuras en la música. Con lentes, right? Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, yeah. exactly like that. Something totally <laughs> not related. Not related and relevant, right? <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. Um, I hope to hear it from you. And thank you, guys. See you thank in the you. next few days. All right. We'll see you. Later.